so I want us um, to really quickly is I was curious to define marriage. And I just went on Webster's Dictionary and I looked it up and the marriage definition means that legally or formally recognized union of two people as partners in a personal relationship. That it's recognized as a union of a personal relationship. Personal and it's a partnership. Can you say partnership? And if you're sitting next to your spouse, say, you're my partner. Yeah, if they're not, don't say that. Um, <laughs> so, and I say that because it's truly a partnership. See, the Lord wants to give each and every one of us that is about to get married or is married or in this area of your life, whatever it may be, if you're going through divorce or uh, have gone through divorce, whatever the situation is and that you're hurting in this area, I want you to know that the Lord wants to minister to that area. He wants to, like I mentioned earlier, to reconcile, to restore, and to give hope. Amen? He doesn't want you just to cut it off and say, well, it's too late for me. It's never too late for you. Amen? A God that redeems, and he always does miraculous works, even if it feels like it's come to an end of you. A lot of times when it comes to the end of us, that's when he can begin. Yes? Amen? So I want our hearts to be receptive of that. But what's interesting to me is that there's a partnership. Marriage is powerful, but marriage is also beautiful. It, is a, it shows the characteristics of our God. Amen? His faithfulness, his commitment to us. It's supposed to shine, shine his character through our marriage. And our marriage is powerful. Because as it says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. Two are better than one. And if that's not the case for you, God wants that to be the case for you. Amen? That it's better to be together. Come on. Two are better than one. See, the enemy knows the power of your partnership, the power of your covenant. Because when you have a vision in your marriage and when you two come together, you're un an unrecognizable force. I tried to say that word. Bear with me. But you are a force to be reckoned with. That's what I meant. Amen. It's my second time preaching. Yes, come on. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, that part. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm totally going blank on it. But the enemy knows the power of partnership. He understands what you two are capable of against the enemy. He understands that, and that's why he attacks it so much. See, the devastation is that we understand there's an attack on marriage in our society, but what has happened is that it's come inside our home, that we are starting to attack each other because we are supposed to be our uh, spouse's partner to fight against the enemy. But what we have done is we become partners with the enemy to fight against our spouse. That's what's happening. And you say, what does that mean? If we are not building up our spouse, we're tearing them down, slowly but surely. A lot of times we do that with not even realizing or recognizing not only is our relationship and intimacy being diminished, but then the attacking starts happening. We attack the person instead of what's behind that person. We start to realize that they're against us, but we're not a team, that we forget that we are on their side. Does that make sense? And so what's happened is that we are called to, our, to be our spouse's helper. As it said in Ecclesiastes 4.9, it says to, be, to help them, to lift them up, right? If you can bring back that verse, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. It's not just the wife that's called the helper in Genesis. We're supposed to help each other as well. It's husband and and wife. And that's what it brings to Ecclesiastes. It says for us to both help when someone is down, discouraged, in depression, uh, dealing with certain battles, dealing with certain things internally, instead of seeing it as, as if they're against you, that you are for them and you're fighting for them, not against them. Amen. 
And so what the enemy has done, he has found his way slowly but surely for you to be against your spouse, to be against our marriage, to fight each other because we started taking it very personal when they fall or when they have a shortcoming. Isn't that true? We do that all the time. And so I believe that certain tools that I want to talk about will be helpful for you because you have to come go back home today. Amen? Yeah? So we're not going to hang out here all day. We have to go back home to our spouses. And the Lord wants us to thrive in our homes. And so I want to just break down three things that are going to help you use as tools to win your spouse's heart over. And when I say to win your spouse's heart over, there, I want you to realize is that there's someone competing for your spouse's heart. And you're saying, well, what do you mean? Not just competing over Satan, but competing over bitterness, competing over resentment, competing over unforgiveness, because that's what comes from, is in relationships, those things harbor. Yes, am I right? And when, you, the, when your heart gets... Uh, you feed on bitterness and resentment and on those things. You don't necessarily have your spouse anymore. You have those things activated and acting out in your relationship. And you're like, where is my spouse? Where can I find my spouse? But all of those things are hiding your spouse when we place those layers. And so we are competing with our a spouse's soul, or not soul, but heart, so that way it's tender-hearted. That's why it's soft. That way our relationship with them has intimacy. So how can we do that? The first one that I want to talk about is one of the things that slowly kills our relationship, which, you know, kills or destroys our intimacy with our spouse, is we choose laziness over action. And I know that's not talked about very much, but I want us to think about that. How many times have we sabotaged our own selves or our own relationship because we were just too tired, right? Exhausted. And you have every right to be. You just came from a big day of work, right? So much demand, even children. There's so much that is required of you that is pulling from you that when you go home, what do you want to do? Anybody want to say it out loud? Like Netflix, watch a movie or completely shut off or play on your you know, phone, some type of game or whatever. But you want to shut off and shut away from the world. That includes your kids and your spouse. Am I right? Yes, yes. Okay. That happens to each and every one of us. And when that happens... The fact is, is that we give our spouse our last, not our best. And we need to give them our best. And the way to do that is we, I understand that sometimes it takes a lot for us to be able to have a conversation or ask how they're doing. It takes energy. You know, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson once said that there was a study that he said, in order to have a thriving relationship with your spouse, you need to take about 90 minutes and have a conversation within a week with them. 90 minutes can be just full on quality time talking to one another, having a conversation that doesn't have your phone, 90 minutes, no matter how busy we are, because we're all busy. Yes, we all have places to go, things to do. We live in a society of busy. But I believe that the Lord wants to establish certain tools for you to succeed. And when we hear these type of things, we need to establish them, amen, so that we can be in a place that thrives. And so 90 minutes, whatever that may look like for you. But see, these 90 minutes are very difficult because, again, it requires energy. It requires energy effort. And a lot of times we go to the place of just being lazy, idle, lethargic. We're just exhausted and tired. And we're like, she's good. He's good. He'll be fine without the conversation or she'll be fine. And all of that, we just kind of brush it off. But every time we do that, we are choosing to have to tear down what we're trying to build. Does that make sense? Because the Lord wants to give us building blocks to build our marriage and our uh, connection with them to be strong. But every action that we have is either a building block or something that we're tearing down. Every action. And so 
That being said, laziness is a form of selfishness, if you think about it. It has to do with you and what you're capable of. And that means you're like, I peace out, I'm good for this moment, if I could put it in those terms. But selfishness puts the fire out quicker than anything else. It removes that intimacy. It removes that, uh, the fire that you two can have and would, ha- would have had. The pursuit of your spouse isn't over when you get married. It must be greater. Did you guys hear that part? The pursuit of your spouse isn't over. It must be greater. And I say that is because a lot of times when we get married, we tap out. Isn't that true? We settle. We settle and we're like, we're fine. And I want to say it's not the time to settle. It's time to strive up right? It's a time to place that effort. It's a time to continuously pursue our spouse, our husbands, and our wives, what, they're, what they like, what they don't like, to be a teacher and a student of them every time. We teach them how to treat us, and we're a student on how to treat them. Amen? We must always be teachable. There's always certain things that are changing and wavering, but you should be a teacher and a student at the same time, telling them how to treat you, what you like and what you don't like, and uh, to be a student of what they like and what they don't like. Amen? And so to be able to be corrected, to be able to be teachable, and those things take effort. Those things take energy. And so we have to choose to act instead of being idle. We need to be active in making sure that we are aware and alert. As 1 Peter talks about even for us, to be alert and to be aware of the enemy prowling like a lion, lion ready to destroy. And that is even in our area of our marriage and our children. We have to be alert and we have to be aware and we have to protect. Come on. And so we don't need to be in a position to be idle, but to be that person and those people that carry excellence, that we look into every area of our life and we say what can I do to make this better what can I do to allow the Lord to cultivate and to be able to grow a vineyard where where it produces fruit see marriage produces life it gives us children but there also should be life of the Lord uh, in the atmosphere in the home in the center of it all amen and if some of you are you know here at this very moment where you're like Man, I'm just tired. I'm tired of her asking me to take out the garbage or to clean the garage. I'm tired. Doesn't she know that I worked all day, you know, and then she's asking me all those things. And all those small little things are great things. I say that because when you uh, respond with honor and say, hey, I'll go do that, it shows that you care. It shows that you listen. It's not the fact that who's dominating one or the other, but you see that it's a team effort, that you guys are helping each other in the smallest ways are the greatest things. Does that make sense? And so I want us just to look, before we move to the next point, is to understand what area in my life, in my marriage, have I stopped doing? That I did when I was dating, but I'm no longer doing for my spouse. Is it those flowers that you should have stopped by at Yolks and picked up? You know, when you said, oh, that extra stretch of five miles, that's $25. You know, we, we make these excuses that are constantly derailing us from uh, bringing a potential in our home. Does that make sense? So we need to ask ourselves, what can I do to cause my marriage to thrive? Of course, that's Holy Spirit will help you. And, and that's what I wanted to say is that you are called to be your spouse's helper. Not just the wise, but the husband as well. I want us to invite Holy Spirit because he is called the greatest helper. He's, in John 14, it describes Holy Spirit as our helper. He can teach you and show you how to be the greatest helper in your marriage. Amen? to cultivate, cultivate, but also to show your children what that looks like. He wants you to create standards in your marriage and which is the word of God to be the standard in your marriage and which he's calling us to be helpers, to lift them up in the times that they need it, but also throughout the day. Amen. Are you guys getting anything? Come on. The next one that I want to talk about is choosing servanthood 
over selfishness. In Matthew 20, uh, 28, it says, I did not come to be served, but to serve. What a great quality. That shows that when we are serving our spouses, our family, our home, it is showing Jesus. Amen. He is the center and should be the center of our home. How can he be in the center of our home? Is by cultivating those characteristics of God. Amen. Jesus himself said, I did not come to get served, but to serve. There's another scripture that I absolutely love that talks about um, his servanthood that I'll go into in just a moment. But it's things like, how can I help you? I love, my, my husband has an, um, on his calendar a little pop-up every single day. And it says, ask, how can I help you? And it almost feels like, really, is that cheating? No, that's not cheating. That's, <laughs> that's rewiring your brain to think a certain way. If something didn't come naturally to you or to us, or we didn't get that opportunity to see in our home, in our raising of when we were kids, but God wants us to do things that will bring us maybe reminders. And if, even if you have to remind yourself on the phone, make sure I ask my wife how she's doing. I mean, if, that, if you need to do that, it's not cheating. It's just to kind of spark to get something going, to act. And if you need a little reminder instead of her reminding you, wonderful. She'll think it came from you, you know? So come on. And it's just small things like that that we could adjust Small little things that seem so insignificant, but they're so significant. And you slowly build. One brick is not a big deal, but it builds a whole home, right? One at a time. So all these small little efforts cultivate that home that we are looking for to allow the Lord to be the center of. And the way to make him the center is to allow his characteristics to evolve in us. To ask, how can I help you? How are you doing? What is it that you need? Remember I said to be a teacher and a student of your spouse. If they tell you, I love A, B, and C, and you don't do it, it hurts all the more because they communicated to you. They maybe even send you links. These days I send links. I'm like, this one, this one, this one. So at any time, I'm like, when you're feeling like you want to bless me, you know, and remind me that you love me, here you go. You're welcome. I have made it so easy for you. I'm not letting you guess. I'm not letting you like, let him figure it out. No, I'm giving you the code. You know, when you say that women are hard to figure out, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to let you figure me out. I'm going to let, I'm going to communicate. This is what I like. And this is what I don't like. Amen. And sometimes we do that for each other, but because of laziness, because we're sometimes so focused on other things, we completely miss what they have said. Am I right? I encourage you to break it off, to shake off idleness, to break off that lethargic uh, you know, behavior and allow Holy Spirit to come in and invite him because he is the one that will give us that energy that we need. Amen? He will give us that grace, but also the desire to create a great relationship in our marriage. Come on. So servanthood. Selfishness chooses me first. Servanthood uh, selfishness chooses me first. Servanthood chooses me last. I want you to hear that again. You know which one is operating in your life if you're always thinking, what about me, what about me, what about me? Wouldn't it be wonderful to create in us, what about him, what about her, first before you? When do we do that? And I'm not saying for us to be condemned, but to create that characteristic in us. What about them? Selfishness always chooses us first. Servanthood chooses us last. Say, I'll go last. I want to help you. Does that make sense? Now, a lot of times, servanthood requires our, how do I say, uh, when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, that aspect of servanthood, when he was about to go on the cross, and he had a lot of needs himself. Many times the Lord will call you to serve your spouse when you have needs that you need the most to be fulfilled. 
and it hard, it's hard and it hurts, especially when your spouse or it feels like your spouse has neglected you or has abandoned you emotionally or spiritually. But then what happens is, is that the Lord calls us sometimes to serve them, the ones that have hurt us the most. See, the Lord is very wise. He knows what he was doing when he said, pray for your enemies and those that have persecuted you. Amen? He knows what he's doing because he knows how to protect his heart. He's, and you're thinking that, well, I don't want to be walked all over. No, 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 no. When you serve, you're not walked over. You're walking over the problem. It's not allowing it to walk all over your soul. He understands the principle. And that's why he guided us in Luke 6 to do so. He understands the concept of protecting our hearts, to pray for those that hate you and those that persecute you. But he also said to be kind to those that are evil and ungrateful. That's what he said in Luke 6. People miss that part. But it spoke to me heavily because sometimes it feels like our own spouses are ungrateful. They don't appreciate us. Am I right? I'm not going to talk about the wicked part. I'm just going to talk about the ungrateful. But what did the Lord tell us to do? To be kind to them. And kind is not just an action or an attitude, but it also is shown through the, the act of servanthood. To serve them in those moments where it feels like you need to be served. But Psalm 23 verse 1 says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I th sometimes don't even understand that revelation that, or that verse that deep yet. Where that's to the point I don't need nothing. Now I'm not saying that we don't, you know, teach our spouses to be able to fulfill our needs or to validate us or validate our emotions. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is readjusting where the Lord belongs back on the throne. And to, be, and to repent that we put our spouses on the throne and are making them be our God to fulfill our needs and our wants. They are complementary, but they are not from the Lord. Amen. The Lord can only fill the void that is hollow in our souls. He can only fix the brokenness that is in our souls, not our spouses. Well, some of us will need to go to a place of repentance and say, God, forgive me that I have idolized my spouse that I've idolized my partner more than I have given you the throne to be able to take care of my needs and my wants. And like I said, they have a duty. There's a reason why we're married. They are responsible. But what I am saying is the priority. Amen? Where you're going to the Lord first before you go to your spouse. So that why you don't have them on a chokehold to be like, hey, you're supposed to fix me. Hey, you're supposed to make me happy. Hey, you're supposed to fill my wants. They are not responsible to make you happy. Happy. You are responsible to make yourself happy. They are not responsible for your joy or your happiness. You are between you and God. It says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Not your spouse. Amen. This is crucial because some of us are suffocating our own marriage, demanding things they cannot give us. You know, and maybe they can at times and will fix it for a moment. It's momentarily, but it's not for the long game. Amen. So then when you get your nice little flowers or we get where they actually take the garbage out or something else where we fulfill their need and want, you'll ask for it again. Well, it's been a month, right? It's been last week. What? It's, it's this thing where it's again and again and again. It's because we're looking at the wrong source. Wrong source. God is the ultimate source. And what the spouse gives is complimentary. Amen? Are you guys getting something? Come on. The last one is choosing humility over pride. This is a big one. Choosing humility over pride. Sometimes we have a better relationship with our ego than our spouse. <laughs> it's true. Some of us have a better relationship with ourselves or our ego than our spouse. I want to protect my ego. I do nothing wrong. Nothing ever. You know, you know when pride is operating, when you know how to point, but you never point at what's going on inside. You know you have a pride problem when everyone is wrong, but you're never wrong. Never. 
you know what? I want to hang around you because you must be sitting on the high throne of Jesus next to him and you know exactly everything. I mean, that attitude that's so prideful where we never do nothing wrong, that's impossible. We are human beings. And if you have a soul wound, you are more able to be wrong because you're looking through the frame of broken glasses. So your perspective and perception is likely 95% wrong a lot of the times. When your soul is whole, we can talk. But when your soul has fragments and it's broken, it's very difficult for you to see correctly every time, to think correctly every time. Am I, am I speaking to someone? How many times have we accused or assumed on someone or on our spouse, which we ended up being wrong? You're like, I wasn't wrong. I just caught them at a wrong time. <laughs> you really have a deep problem. Just kidding. But... But really, there's a lot of times where our spouses will bring us to a place of humility. Come on. Where marriage exposes a lot of times our brokenness. It, it expresses and shows our character. That's why sometimes it's really hard. You know, they say that marriage and uh, having children is the end of your life. That's incorrect. Your marriage and your children is not the end of your life. It's the end of your center, self-centered life. Okay? That's the end of it because it exposes how selfish you truly are. Because you have to serve. You have to take care of your children at all given times. The reason why people don't like it or they're negative about it is because they're speaking out of flesh. They're speaking out of their self-centeredness. Your life isn't over. It's actually just beginning a place where you can cultivate that godly character. The, the life, Christ-centered life that God has designed for us. And our spouses provoke us a lot for that. Yes? So going back to the pride and the humility is we must accept we're not always right. And that we all carry toxic traits. I, there was a message that uh, everyone's like, hmm, feeling out that. We all can carry toxic traits, okay? The more that I would read or the more things that I was guided towards, I recognized, I was like, oh, that's toxic. And it's not him. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> and that takes a lot of self-awareness with Holy Spirit conviction to do that for us. Yes? That is. Is it possible that that toxic trait is you? That not everyone is wrong, always wrong, and you're maybe the one that's wrong? And that you've created the shell around you that everyone does wrong except you? We need to break ourselves. I'm not saying to have a broken, be a broken person, but a broken humility, surrenderance, yield, and say, Lord, work on me, fix me. Not only should we be teachable and students of our spouses, but we need to be students to be teachable between us and God. Where he said, hey, the way you talked to him, that was disrespectful. When, when you were talking to her, you were provoking something. You know, um, speaking of blaming game, my husband and I have this uh, fun thing over the years. I don't know, uh, it's a trait and it's fun, but he likes, to, you know how like poke the bear long enough and you're gonna hear him roar? <laughs> and so he has this, uh, call it fun, personality trait about him, but like poke, 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 poke until you see something, you know, if there's anything in there. And if you catch me on a good day, you can't get to me, you know? I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I joke it off and I'm, but if I'm going through something in my mind and my husband decides to play that game and he starts poking, poking, you know, po po playing the poking game, oh, then you're gonna see something, you know, come out where it's like, he's like, I was just joking. I was, <laughs> pause, pause, I'm just time out, time out, I was just joking. And so, but I'm like, it's over at that point. You got me to the other line. And sometimes we do that as fun or joking in, a, in our relationships. But he likes to say, he's like, what's the point of having a wife if you can't blame her, you know? And so that's a joke for right now, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. We shouldn't do that to each other. That's my point, okay? That's toxic. <laughs> so not, I'm not saying about him. I'm just saying that there's certain things that we blame game. We blame each other. We provoke each other and all that stuff. It's fun for, like, jokes and things. And if you guys have that, you know, in your personality, in your relationship. But what I'm talking about is where it's like this, you're constantly blaming, you know, that person for having an issue when you have a log in your eye. You know, a huge log where it's like, are you, honestly, you're so focused on that person and their wrongs that you're the one that's blind to self, right? So we have to constantly come to a, back to a place of humility. Philippians 2, 3, 8 says this. Uh, 2, 3 through 8. And this scripture will be in the back. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility. Value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. How do we bring Jesus into the center of our relationship? It's having a Christ-like mind. And he said, always value and look up to others more than you. With a humble heart. It's creating that, cultivating that servanthood, creating that place of humility, that I will be teachable, that when they come and they're helping me with my blind spots, that I don't attack them. But when he or she comes and not necessarily corrects, at times corrects, sometimes, you know, speaks of your blind spot, sometimes say, hey, could you be softer with me? Can you be more graceful for me? Can you stop looking at your phone while I'm talking to you? That hurts my feelings or et cetera, et cetera. That we take what they say and we, we listen to their critique because when you listen to them, you make the relationship better. You're not losing. I promise you're winning. Amen. It feels like you're losing because that's ego losing, but your relationship is winning. Amen. In the midst of all of this that we're talking about, where we choose to act and pursue our spouse, not be lazy. In the midst of serving and not being selfish, in the midst of humility instead of pride, what we're doing is we're cultivating a safe place for our, for our marriage, a safe place for your spouse. I want to ask you, are you a safe place for your spouse? You know if you are, when they come to you and they, you know, were, had a shortcoming and you exposed, or you exposed them or you made them feel unsafe, you responded out of anger, you condemned them, you judged them, you rebuked them, whatever it was, but you weren't a safe place. The Lord wants us to cultivate a safe place for our spouse so that we can help each other to get closer to Christ. See, what happens is, is that if you're not a safe place for your spouse, you tempt them to sin. See, it's already hard for them, outside world, to tempt them. There's temptation all around us, am I right? Constantly knocking on our door, seeing if we will open the door to that temptation, to that sin, to that shortcoming, to falling. We are all tempted. But what happens is, is that the beautiful part about two are better than one. That when one falls, you can help them get back up. Or you push them down. Do we partner with the enemy at that time? Or do we partner with Holy Spirit to help them up? And by doing that, this is the example I want to give. I have an example, okay? Recently, when I'm talking about being a safe place for our spouses... I had a situation that happened a couple of weeks ago where, you know, there's a stereotype about a woman on their driving skills, okay? And especially with the curbs. So I want to tell you and confess right now, the curbs find me. I don't find them, okay? I don't know how many times I'm like, where did you come from until it's over and I went up, up the bump and... There's times and seasons where I'm really good, and then there's times where it sneaks up on me, and I, I hit the curb. And you know, anyway, moving forward, 
This time, I hit the curb, and it was on a little bit extra high speed, okay? It wasn't slow speed. It was high speed. And it was just a glimpse of a second that I was distracted, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> we just took the car two days ago to get it aligned, and then here I am, like, running over a curb one more time with high speed, which is worse than the first one. And I can't tell you enough how much anxiety and I was freaking out. I'm like, okay. I was really scared. And I was like, okay, I, I, I'm not going to tell him. No, I have to tell him because we're leaving out of town and we're driving. He'll figure it out. And so I'm being tempted to lie, okay? I'm being tempted to sin, okay? Lying is a sin, by the way. Devil is a liar, right? So I was tempted to make up the story completely to cover my tracks. Are you guys following me here? And so I was so tempted because I was like, I, I don't want him to get angry or upset or, you know, whatever. And, uh, and I want him to know I'm a good driver. You know, like I am good. So, because I am, I am good. But anyways, so, but I was reminded of how my husband has really like came to a new level of how he responds to me with such grace and such ease. And he was, he's been so gentle to me. So it gave me the strength to confess <laughs> because I knew how he would respond to me. I knew that I was going to be in a safe place telling him my shortcoming. Are you guys following what I'm saying? So I texted him and I told him the truth. Okay, I did. I did not lie. I told him the truth. And he said, that's okay, babe but how fast were you going, you know? And, and I was like, why are you asking for details? Like you never ask for details and like never. And he's like, pass the details, just tell me the point. But now he's asking me for the details, like how fast were you going? What was, where was it at? He even asked me where it was at. And I'm like, why, why do you even care? So, but mind you, the concern of the car, okay? But all that to say, I had the strength to come to him because I knew he was a safe place instead of rebuking me, condemning me, and making me feel bad. Amen? I want to bring up a scripture about the aim for each and every one of us. Proverbs 31, verse 11 and 12. It says, the heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. That's a good place to be. And I want to ask you today, are you a safe place for your husband, for your wife? Are you a place where they are compelled to tell you instead of tempted to hide? See, sometimes we have issues or your spouse is struggling and they're struggling silently. They're struggling silently because they're afraid of being safe with you because they already rebuke themselves for falling, for falling short, for falling again, for having attempted and falling. But are you a safe place where you understand that you're not fighting your spouse, you're fighting a darkness, an entity behind them. And you said, I am your partner. I'm on your team. I am on your side. And we're going to pray together. It's going to be all right. You may have a hiccup. Yeah, it hurt me a little, but I know that we're going to hurt the devil a little bit greater. Amen. So I want to ask you, are you a safe place for your husband and for your wife? Can they come to you when things are short, when you fell out of grace, when you think that you're not good enough, when business seems like your hands are not blessed, but they're cursed? Can your spouse pray you through? Can your spouse be the one to help you? I want you to know this is not a time to condemn, but to remind you that you have the power, wife, you have the power, husband, to lift them up because you are called to help them. You you have the power and the authority to lift them out of the dark entity that they are fighting amen you have the power and the authority and just because circumstantially you're reminded that it feels like no one listens to you at home you're constantly yelling you're constantly trying to tell them will you please listen to me but they ignore you I want you to know that the spiritual realm trust me they know your authority 
Sometimes circumstantially, we doubt how much power we have as a wife and as a husband. But I want you to know is that you do carry power and authority. Because when you pray, things shift. And the enemy is a liar. And he's been telling you that when you pray, nothing's happening. It's getting worse. But it's about to get better. I want you to know that when you pray against that generational curse, it's falling off. I want you to know when your husband is addicted. I want you to know is that it will fall off in the mighty name of Jesus. This is the time for you to know that you can lift them up and be a safe place for not only to confess but to cultivate a thriving relationship with the Lord and with you you can come to a place where it's intimate because when you come to a place of intimacy they can come to a place of intimacy with the Lord you can become a safe place when you dwell in the secret place some of us have neglected that and that's why you're not safe that's why we have partnered with the enemy as an accuser and as an assum an assumption or a summer whatever that word is assumption or the fact that we are respond with anger or we act in a uh, we have an atmosphere of animosity all of those things create a toxic environment but when we dwell in the secret place more we become a place that is safe and we begin to carry the characteristics of the Lord, amen? And that is how we can be in the center, Christ-centered home, come on. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.